All I've wanted to do is be in that team and go to the Paralympics. Wheels of Gold, now on BBC One. Honestly, I, I, what, I just can't... Slightly older and still just as grumpy, the grumpy old men are back. Tomorrow at 10 on BBC Two. It's made me realise there's nothing more important than your family. You've got to put them before everything else. They are your top priority. Are you stopping for another one, Joe? Please, Ken. Room 101 and Early Doors, new Monday night comedy from 9.30 on BBC Two. What are free radicals? It's beta carotene causing cancer. What's retinol? Do retinols prevent colds and infections? Is my vitamin A giving me osteoporosis? For a straight answer about vitamins, look to Horizon next Thursday at 9 on BBC Two. Newsnight now on BBC Two with Kirsty Walk. Tonight, why has the Westminster government failed to act to save thousands of lives, allowing the twin killers, smoking and salt, to roam free? Today, Ireland boasted falling cigarette sales after banning smoking in public places. Tonight, Scotland's First Minister tells us he's considering the same for Scotland, the lung cancer capital of Europe. And will the government really call time on the stream of salt pouring into our food? Newsnight has learned that despite tough talk, the government has not held the food industry to its deadline on salt reduction. Also tonight, what will a Milburn manifesto for the general election look like? And will Gordon Brown sign up to it? I concluded that genocide has been committed in Darfur. And America pronounces on Darfur. But what is the US and the UK going to do about it now? Good evening. Tonight we devote much of the programme to our arteries. The government has a choice. It could ban smoking in public places, thus saving the lives of many smokers and non-smokers, and it could make reductions in salt levels and food products compulsory. <clears throat> so why doesn't it? Is it really worried about being described as the nanny state, or perhaps it's enthralled to industry? Smoking first. Today, one of Ireland's leading cigarette manufacturers revealed that sales have plummeted since the Republic government banned cigarettes in public places. The Scottish executives also considering a ban, buoyed by the huge response to a questionnaire on smoking. I'll be speaking to Scotland's First Minister in a moment, but now here's Peter Marshall. Dundee, it's one of Britain's poorest cities and it's sky high in figures for the 21st century's biggest addictive killer, the number of its people who smoke. Now Dundee may become the first town in the country to introduce a smoking ban in public places. I think that would be a very good idea, a very good idea, yeah, for the health of the, the people and uh, for non-smokers. <laughs> Passive smoking is pretty bad. There's a lot of things to you. So I think, yeah, it's a good idea. The reason the authorities in Dundee are so keen on a smoking ban can be found across the sea in Ireland. Here, the tobacco company Gallagher has announced a 7.5% drop in sales. And it's largely attributed to the fact that just six months ago, Ireland became the first European country to introduce a law banning smoking in bars and restaurants. We are very um, happy with the outcome so far of the new workplace smoking law. Compliance levels are very high, in excess of 95%. Um, I think the public support for the ban is still very strong, both among uh, smokers and non-smokers. And um, employers are working very hard to ensure compliance with the law. Every year, 114,000 people die in Britain from smoking-related diseases. According to anti-smoking groups, a public smoking ban would annually save nearly 5,000 lives in England, Scotland and Wales. They base this on the belief that half a million smokers would give up. Eighteen months ago, New York City banned smoking in restaurants and bars. 
After a year, they found 150,000 fewer New Yorkers were exposed to secondhand smoke. Researchers also tested the level of cotinine, a nicotine byproduct used to determine non smokers' exposure to secondhand smoke. After the ban, the levels of cotinine declined by 85%. Back in Scotland, there's been a massive response to a government consultation on banning smoking in public places. The First Minister says he's more convinced that a ban is possible. If it doesn't come nationally, the Health Board in Dundee will push for one there. Bans in public places create a culture which is no smoking. And by doing that, it starts to um, develop the idea that you know, smoking is not the norm. In fact, it's no smoking is the norm. Faced with all this evidence and activity from Ireland and Scotland, publicans in England and Wales are taking what looks like preemptive action of their own. The Beer and Pub Association say they want to ban smoking in parts of all their pubs in the hope of avoiding a complete ban at the hands of the government later. They say within five years, 80% of what they call pub space will be smoke-free. That, they maintain, is in line with the public's wishes, not a complete ban. The point here is choice but that that choice should reflect the pattern of smoking in society. So 70% of the population are non-smokers, and this is a move to accommodate that within pubs. By the end of next year, smoking will be banned at the bar in all those pubs, and if they have a restaurant area, then at least 50% of that will be non-smoking. But it sounds good, but it's not good enough, is it? I mean, the point here is you're dodging a ban, you're trying to avoid a real ban. Well, because bans are very damaging on the pub sector. We've seen that in Ireland. Trade is 15% down. And if that happens in Britain, that means 5,000 pubs closed, 75,000 jobs are lost, and three and a half billion pounds is lost to the economy. But those who want a ban say the New York experience suggests while there may be an initial dip in pub business, that would soon recover. The government, however, are undecided. Most notably, the health minister himself seems wary of a ban. Sometimes, as my mother would put it, people from those lower social economic categories have very few pleasures in life, and one of them they regard is smoking. So I just worry slightly about the unanimity of the medical uh, profession and activists. What we're dealing with here is, is, is a poison, something that, um, you know, um, when breathed in, is going to um, cause ir irreparable damage to your heart. And I think that the British Heart Foundation and, and groups like us are saying that we need to make this um, a legislative ban, just as we did with seatbelts. The health argument, the argument about the effectiveness of a ban on smoking in public places, has been bolstered enormously by the evidence from New York and Ireland. The government's health white paper, due within weeks, will show whether they have the political will to act. Peter Marshall, well, in a moment I'll be speaking to Melanie Johnson, the Public Health Minister, but first I'm joined by Scotland's First Minister, Jack McConnell. Jack McConnell, why were you so taken with the ban in the Irish Republic? Well, I was partly taken by the ban in the Irish Republic because of the scale of the problem in Scotland. We have approximately 13,000 people in Scotland who die every year from smoking-related diseases. 70% of the over 1 million smokers in Scotland say they would like to give up. And we need to try and find easier ways for them to do that. And in Dublin, it's quite clear the ban has been enforceable. Uh, it has worked well. Smokers who are still smoking are smoking much less, but many are also finding it easier to give up too. So it's very attractive for us in Scotland, although we will wait till the end of our consultation before we make a decision. However, the consultation and the level of the response to consultation suggests that, in a sense, it's becoming a huge public issue and the public are maybe perhaps ahead of you on this. Uh, you talked about... Uh, the need to have consistency in the ban, you would presumably be looking for a national ban. Well, one of the interesting things in Dublin was that the, the hoteliers and publicans that I met said that it had been easier to enforce the ban and the ban had been more successful because it had been consistently applied and there weren't different arrangements in different establishments or different arrangements within establishments. Now, some of them had not held that view six months ago, and certainly nine months ago, I didn't hold that view, but I have been very interested. The evidence from New York and from Ireland is very powerful, uh, and we in Scotland have got a huge problem, far worse than anywhere else, and we want to deal with that, and we do believe this is a serious option we have to consider.
So you don't subscribe to uh, John Reed's view that a ban would be patronising to poorer smokers? Well, I think we need to be sensitive to the rights of the individual here and we need to take that into account. But uh, as I said, 70% of those individuals themselves say on the record they would like to give up. They find it hard to do that. By far, the most difficult part of one's life to give up is in one's social life, uh, in pubs and restaurants and when one is out and about socialising. And I think, therefore, anything that we can do to help people in those circumstances, if it's enforceable, if it's practical, uh, and if it can be done in a sensible way, I think is, uh, is worth serious consideration, well, particularly here in Scotland. Well, the, the Conservatives in Scotland, the Conservatives Health spokesman said that the, this whole consultation exercise is a complete sham and irrelevant. Can you guarantee that actually there will be some legislation in the statute book before perhaps even the end of the year? Well, I, I think there's one thing that, uh, uh, in which there should be no doubt, Kirsty, and that is uh, that the, op the one option we will not pursue is no action. The Conservatives in Scotland would like us to take no action there. They are completely enthralled to those who lobby uh, on behalf of those who make profits from cigarettes. They, uh, in Scotland, have said that there's no risk from passive smoking, when we all know that there is. All of the evidence shows that passive smoking is dangerous, uh, and they, ha they show no commitment to tackling uh, this vital issue. Yeah. We will tackle it. We will make the right choice between a complete ban and a partial ban. We'll do that in a considered way, but we will take action. There should be no doubt about that at all. Jack McCall, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Melody Johnson, do you agree that there would be a benefit in banning smoking in public places? There's certainly a benefit from doing that. There's certainly a benefit too from a lot of other action like helping people to stop smoking, uh, publicising the dangers of secondhand smoke and the ban on advertising, many of which uh, we've already undertaken and, and, and made big progress But on. in the Healthy Britain um, campaign that the BBC is involved with, uh, the, one of the surveys showed that 67% of people polled support a ban in all workplaces, including pubs and clubs. The thing is the public's ahead of you in this. Yes. Well, well, we haven't actually said what we're doing yet. But on your this. consultation all, all was finished by June uh, the 30th. What, what, uh, what were the first findings? Yes. Well, the, the, the findings in terms of the results of that is that there's a lot of support um, towards banning uh, smoking uh, in public places. But we know from polling that, in fact, there's a different result from looking at different forms of public place. So, for example, there's a much stronger support for banning smoking in restaurants than there is in pubs. And it depends on which category you look at, at as, as to what the, the degree of support actually is. Now uh, Jack McConnell said there that the model that Ireland had followed seemed to be a, a good one because there was a consistency mm -hmm. and a consistency and people accepted it more because it was a national ban. However Tony Blair seems to suggest that uh, in England and Wales presumably it might be left to local authorities which is a much more piecemeal affair. Which is it? <laughs> well, as I say, it will, what we're doing will, will be announced as part of the White Paper on Public Health, but actually what we've also consulted on as part of, in the Labour Party, through the big conversation, was actually at local bans, and we've also looked at those. It's interesting to see the, the, the results that have come in. But there will be a change within the year, then, of some sort, either uh, local bans I or national we bans? Shall, we will certainly be looking at the ways in which we address uh, the smoking in public places and taking some form of action as a result of the white paper. Mary Johnson, for now, thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you in a moment. Well, three months ago, the government extended the deadline for the food industry to come up with radical plans to cut the level of salt in food if the manufacturers were to avoid compulsory action. Then, Melanie Johnson told Newsnight the amount of salt in our diet was actually rising, but refused to bring in either labelling or a policy of name and shame. But Newsnight has discovered the consultations with industry are actually in a shambles, just as people are hardening their attitudes to salt in their food. 80% of people who responded to a poll commissioned for the BBC's Healthy Britain Week want the government to take action and make it more difficult to eat unhealthily by restricting salt, fat and sugar in processed food. Liz McKean reports on how we've become a nation of salt junkies. Because we're not using much salt in this, we're going to put some other flavours in there. We're going to put uh, the, the freshly degraded nutmeg, which gives it a lift. The other thing that you can use in place of salt is a little bit of zest of lemon. Okay. Celebrity chefs have tried to rescue the British diet from blandness. We'll make the first crack, which I guarantee you will stick. Now, Nick Nairn wants to cure it of something else, an ingredient that permeates our food 
and is said to be a leading cause of ill health. And it was one gram of salt per 100 grams. Chocolate! He believes we're now addicted to salt and, like junkies, we need to be weaned off it. I want to cook food which has really high quality ingredients and cook it properly and create a harmonious dish without the use of an awful lot of salt. But if people are addicted to salt and their reference point is very high, they'll taste the food that I cook and they'll think, do you know that's quite bland? A little bit of that around the outside. We're eating more salt than ever without even realising it. Most of it, 80%, is hidden in the food we buy. Not just takeaways or sausages, but staples like bread and cereal, just the kind of food we give our children. Wait for wait, there is more salt in these crisps than seawater. Now, this is seawater, 2.5%. Add this extra for the amount that's in the crisps, 4%. Salt is linked to a growing health menace, high blood pressure, a condition that affects nearly half the adult population. Fiona Carnan has come to Nick Nen's cook school near Glasgow to learn more. She has special reason to be concerned. I was at work one day and felt unwell at lunchtime. I ended up going to hospital to the accident and emergency department in the afternoon. And the first I knew was when the nurse asked me, how long have you had high blood pressure? And I had no idea. Fiona was found to have kidney failure and has since had a transplant. It made her think about the salt in her diet. When I look back now and when I consider what I know now about salt that's in everyday foods, then probably my salt intake was reasonably high. A new survey of processed food shows just how easy it is to eat large amounts of salt, even when making apparently healthy choices. Take a breakfast of Sainsbury's Be Good To Yourself Flakes and Orchard Fruit, 1.84 grams, two slices of Marks and Spencer toast, two grams, two Sainsbury's Hot and Spicy Sausages, 2.84 grams, lunch of a Budgeon's Pork Pie, 4.25 grams, and a dinner of seeds of change organic tomato soup, 4.46 grams, and two Tesco smoked salmon fish cakes and vegetables, 3.6 grams. You'll have eaten virtually 19 grams of salt, more than three times the recommended level. Well, salt is, is, is very dangerous. It's the main cause of the rise in blood pressure that occurs with age and therefore responsible for all people with high blood pressure. Now, in the UK, approximately 40% of the adult population have high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is the major cause of strokes, heart attacks, and heart failure. So it is responsible for approximately 120,000 deaths a year in the UK. Graham McGregor and his researchers are convinced that a reduction in the amount of salt we eat will save lives. They claim that a cut of 10% of salt in processed foods would lead to 14,000 fewer strokes and heart attacks each year. Half of those, 7,000, are fatal. However, even within the medical profession, there's disagreement about the extent to which salt is to blame. I feel that there are lots of population-based risk factors that we need to actually concentrate upon and I would number salt as perhaps one of these factors, but not the be-all and end-all of what our communities do in terms of uh, their lifestyles and how it impacts upon their circulation and heart disease. Whatever the level of proof, the government has determined we should eat less salt. It's taking action with the FSA, its Food Standards Agency. Most of us eat around 11 grams of salt a day, the Department of Health wants that reduced to six grams. Some advisers think it should be cut even further to three. Some food companies already offer lower salt foods, but in the processed meat industry where some salt is added for safety reasons, levels remain especially high. And they're unlikely to be lowered in the immediate future.
Last Christmas, the government asked the food industry to come up with plans to lower salt content by February. Health Minister Melanie Johnson was unhappy with their response. In a general letter in June, she complained the plans were often too short on detail and specific actions. The food industry, in turn, was unhappy with her response. We got a rather surprising letter from Melanie Johnson, uh, which seemed to take no account of the steps that we had taken to uh, reduce salt, uh, which we had indeed agreed with the government agency, the Food Standards Agency. So we haven't had a specific response to our action plan from the Department of Health. Instead, Melanie Johnson asked everyone to submit revised plans by the 18th of September. But every food producer we've contacted pointed out that the lack of an individual response to their original plans makes it difficult to come up with new ones. So, if they needed it, they now have the perfect excuse to ignore the Minister's deadline. Melanie Johnson has asked us to submit our action plan, a revised action plan, along with others in the food industry by the 18th of September. We've already told her that we're not going to do that, we're not going to meet that um, deadline, we're going to submit a revised action plan. Uh, because we believe that our action plan is fine, we agreed it with the Food Standards Agency and we're making good progress towards achieving the targets that we've, we've set ourselves. Actually it's chicken flavour soup mix and when you look closely at the list of ingredients, the ingredients in order of weight are first and foremost salt. Malcolm Kane has spent his career in the food industry. He used to be Sainsbury's head of food safety extracts. It's, it's very significant for three things. Firstly, there's no chicken. Secondly, there's no chicken flavour. And thirdly, the biggest ingredient is salt. Even in identical products, he says there can be vast differences in salt levels. It's often added to suit the food industry, not the consumer. It is a savoury flavour in its own right and therefore it masks and allows you to use cheaper flavourings or lower meat contents, that's one thing. It also is a water binder so it helps to make, helps um, in conjunction particularly with other salts like sodium polyphosphates to help water to be bound in uh, to the, particularly the meat content of, of, of foods and fresh meats and, and cooked meats. Um, so it helps in the water absorption which is, improves the, the succulents, the eating succulents which is a definite product improvement uh, but of course it also adds water which is a weight improvement and a cost improvement as well. Scotland can boast its scenery but its health record leaves more to be desired. Its diet contains more salt than anywhere in the UK. Bread is one of the main sources. Back at Nick Nairn's cook school, Fiona Carnan wants to make sure her children avoid the dangers of eating too much of it. They're taking part in an experiment. Right, guys, let's start with the ones that have got no salt in them at all, OK? So these are just nice and warm, right out of the oven. Then you look horrified. Yeah, it's disgusting. You don't like it? Mm -hmm. That's okay. I love it. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to move up a big leap. These are 1% salt, okay? That's 0.4 grams of sodium. That would qualify for these to be called lower salt, just and no more. Mmm, that's quite nice, yeah. And if, we, and if we try these rolls at the end here, these are the sort of standard 2% salt, about 0.8 grams sodium per 100 grams. Once you swallow the bread, can, can you actually just taste that salt in your mouth? It sort of builds up in your, in your, in your mouth. It's residual salt. You, you, you don't need that much salt in there. All the really sexy things in food, the real nuances in food, are flavours that happen up in your olfactory canal, in your nose, the things that, the, the delicate things. The tongue is a bit of a blunt instrument. It can really only dictate, it can only detect, detect hot, sweet, salty, sour flavours. And they're big sort of blunt flavours, and they go straight to your brain and say, hey, lots of stuff happening in here. And they mask those subtle flavours that happen. Most of our salt comes from Cheshire, where the deposits are closest to the surface. At the new Cheshire Salt Works, it's found in brine, which is then evaporated to produce salt. Salt manufacturers aren't at all happy to have their product cast as the villain of modern diets. Around here, it's celebrated as a life force, 
central to food safety and quality and vital in medicine like kidney dialysis and saline drips. Salt has been produced in this area since Roman times and there's a view that the wisdom of the ages is being lost in a misguided government pursuit of health targets. They believe the government hasn't properly thought through the consequences of a diet where salt is largely off the menu. It's an extremely dangerous policy without looking at the risks, without properly taking into account international scientific opinion, which again and again has repeated that there is no benefit to the normal tense of population. So what we're seeing is uh, effectively because of a, a smaller proportion of hypertensive people in the, uh, the overall uh, nation, uh, the whole diet of the complete nation is being altered to uh, accommodate this. The potential dangers of excess salt were raised more than a decade ago, ever since the food industry has been under pressure to act. It's well known that the more salt you eat, the thirstier you become. Since many producers have an interest in both the snacks and soft drink sectors, those who want change believe it's being held up for commercial reasons. Quite frankly, they put the salt into these products. We as consumers didn't ask it, ask for it to be put there. Did you ask for all this salt to be put in the food? Did you? You didn't. And the fact is that they're responsible now for all these strokes and heart attacks. They, they are the ones who are putting it there. The public can't get it out, and they need to do something about it. And I think that if they don't respond, they will be held responsible for all these strokes and heart attacks that are occurring unnecessarily in the UK. Salt um, actually has a function in some foods, so it's not easy to reduce salt overnight um, for very technical reasons. Um, equally, our customers would notice if we suddenly cut salt out in a way that um, perhaps reduced the flavour in a product. And one needs to find substitutes quite often for salt. So although I recognise what Professor McGregor is saying, it's not quite as simple as he suggests it is. One solution to hidden salt is clearer labelling. At the moment, it isn't mandatory, and it is confusing. Some producers declare it a sodium. This allows them to show a lower reading than the salt equivalent, which is two and a half times greater. The EU is due to update regulations this year, and there's a call for greater clarity. 0.8 grams of sodium per 100 grams doesn't mean anything to the consumer. Let's stick on green you know, low, very low salt, fill your boots, eat as much as you like. Amber, go with caution. Red, don't touch it. If you're out working and, and you come home and you want to just prepare a, a family meal quickly, um, it's very easy to, to turn to a jar of sauce or a packet of something to make up a meal. And the amount of salt that's in that, it, it's frightening. The only way to avoid too much salt is to cook fresh food. In our fast food society, we're doing less of it. That puts the food industry in charge of our salt intake. Unless or until they act, buyer beware. Les McKean, Melanie Johnson, um, you slapped the wrists of many in the industry three months ago. You also wrote them a letter saying, in order to ensure transparency, I intend to post my response to your initial plans and our assessment of them on both the Department of Health website and the FSA websites. They're not there. Where are they? Well, my guess is they're still in the process of being posted, and if you'd drawn that, that to my attention, we would have ago. actually... Uh, well, I, I don't personally check these things. Obviously, they need to go on. But, I mean, the point about this is not about whether we posted things on websites. It it's, kind it's of is, about, it's about you just say that was, that was it's really about the import of your letter? No, no, the, the main import of my letter was actually they weren't producing things that were specific and measurable and for which they could be easily held but to if account. You don't give them some your of them detailed were very response. unspecific. If you don't give them your detailed response, which you promise here mm -hmm. that has given them an excuse and we've heard and we've had letters from others as well we've got emails we've, here we to have, not to give you a further indication we, of how they're going to comply we that is to say uh, the government and the FSA um, have received responses from a number of, of uh, manufacturers and retailers they? not absolutely everybody United at the moment. Biscuits, we're, still in, snacks. we're still in discussion with an, a number uh, of those people Your about what they're the 18th actually of going September. to produce 
it, it, I, yes, it, the, the deadline is the 18th of September. The point about this is, Kirsty, that we're trying to actually get people to reduce salt by measurable stages to try and get all of the industry to do it across the board, to do it largely across most of the things that we actually regularly consume, because that way our taste buds will gradually acclimatise down. That way it won't be an issue for different sectors of the industry, what other sectors of the industry and retail are, do retailing are, are doing, and to make progress on something which most experts say is actually a danger to our health and which we don't actually need in our diets. Can I just say this sounds uh, very familiar to what you were saying three months ago and then you promised to get tough, you wrote this letter, you said you were going to give them detailed responses and then they would have to come back. We haven't. You haven't done that. So therefore uh it's People not like, actually the 20th of September yet on my, uh, so on my diary. After so three months, you're going to in, suddenly we, give responses to all these companies in the next six days? We, we, well, of course, the companies could have come to us in any case and talked to us and talked to the FSA first. But why would they do and that? They They've got no in interest contact. in doing that. Well, they, they do actually have an interest in doing it. They have a very big interest in doing it. There is growing consumer awareness. The Food Standards Agency has actually surveyed people, and a very large percentage, more than half of people, already recognize recognize that salt is an issue and they want to see salt reduced. So it's already an issue. This coming week we have Blood Pressure Awareness Week uh, and the, the FSA and I will jointly be announcing uh, and launching a salt awareness campaign with consumers. So there is not already, there's already pressure, there will be more pressure uh, on retailers and at the end of the day it's in the interests of retailers and manufacturers as much as it is of the government to have healthy consumers living a long time. Melanie Johnson. 80% of people uh, who responded to a question on whether the government should take action over this for the Healthy uh, Britain campaign said you should take definite action. And yeah, yet, that's, why, that's what we're but, doing. And yet you are not, you are absolutely not uh, insisting on labelling or naming and shaming. Yeah. The very things that three months ago you said you might have to do if yes. people didn't come up with better plans for that's their own right. salt reduction. That's right, and so we will look at that in the autumn as we see what they have put in and as we see what progress we're making it takes a little time for the food standards agency to cost those plans in terms of what they mean for salt because you can't just look at something and say that's what it means for salt intake in the population you have to cost it and work out those figures work out what it will mean for reductions for the average consumption of various things so that needs that work okay. needs to be right. done we uh, certainly have been doing some naming and shaming the food standards agency has done quite a lot of naming and shaming and uh, we are certainly looking with them at what can be achieved across Europe. The labelling of requirements are done on a European basis. The Commission has asked for information from member states about where uh, the labelling should go. The Food Standards Agency has done work and it's actually putting that work now to the Commission, which includes the idea, for example, of something like traffic lights, certainly information which people can readily understand and the Food Standards Agency is looking at that on behalf of the government and on behalf of consumers. Melanie Johnson, thanks very much Thank indeed. You. Coming up on the programme... Are Britain and the US at odds over whether the violence in Darfur amounts to a genocide? But first, a roundup of today's news. Our main story tonight, sales of cigarettes in Ireland have fallen dramatically following a ban on smoking in public places. Speaking on this programme, the Public Health Minister, Melanie Johnson, said the government were looking closely at similar measures. It's being reported that the Al-Qaeda-linked group Jamia Islamia has claimed responsibility on a website for a car bomb attack outside the Australian embassy in Jakarta that killed at least nine people. The Australian foreign minister called the blast a direct attack on his country, although those killed were all thought to be Indonesian. Australian and Indonesian forensic experts said the explosives used were similar to that in the Bali bombing in 2002. The number two figure in Al-Qaeda has appeared on the video tape on the, rabbi, on the Arabic television station Al Jazeera. In it, Ayam al-Zawahari claims the American forces have only limited control in Afghanistan with holy fighters or Mujahideen taking over. A young British couple have been shot dead in Thailand. Adam Lloyd and Vanessa Arscott were killed early this morning in a town near the River Kwai, west of Bangkok. Police said an arrest warrant had been issued for the main suspect, a police sergeant, who has been missing since the shooting. A powerful hurricane has swept through the southeastern Caribbean islands, killing at least 15 people. 
Hurricane Ivan, which has reached Category 5, is now traveling at 160 miles per hour. It is expected to reach Jamaica on Friday and western Cuba at the weekend. It is thought to be the worst hurricane to hit the Caribbean in a decade. In tennis, Tim Henman is through to the semi-finals of the US Open for the first time. He beat Slovakia's Dominic Karelby by three sets to one and will play the Wimbledon champion Roger Federer on Saturday. Henman has never made a Grand Slam final, having lost four Wimbledon semi-finals and one at the French Open earlier this year. And the markets. The FTSE 100 share index closed 20 points, while in New York the Dow Jones was down 24 points. In London, against the euro, the pound rose. Against the dollar, the pound also rose. The government's chaotic and traumatic reshuffle is complete, and key figures have been moved about the chessboard, with rising stars Ruth Kelly, now in the Cabinet Office, and Douglas Alexander, Minister of State for Trade and Industry. But it is Alan Milburn's decision to spend more time with his government that really matters to future Labour policy. So when he define, designs and defines the manifesto, will he opt for consolidation or radical change? Our political correspondent, David Grossman, is here. Um, David, um, what will the division be? Well, partly this is about personalities. There is, after all, only so much power and influence to go around. But there is, at the heart of this, also a d division about what should be the strategy at the next election. Gordon Brown's view is that Labour should fight the next election on its record. For example, in health, the money that's going into health is set to rise well into the next Parliament. So why, he thinks, do you need to go on about more radical change? Tony Blair and Alan Milburn see things differently. They think that the only way to excite the electorate is to offer them a radical vision of the future. In their jargon, the forward offer. It has to be radical. Oh, sorry, the forward offer. That's the jargon that does the rounds in Westminster at the moment. It's the forward offer. <laughs> it's the recipe. It's the, the menu that you offer voters at the next election that gets excited enough to vote. Contentment, they think, only breeds apathy. Well, has there been an end in the last, just say, few hours to the ferocious briefing that was going on? There has. This morning, Alan Milburn was bending over backwards to say what a towering figure Gordon Brown is, what a key role he'll be playing in the election. The Chancellor's people, a little less keen, they've been saying that they're not really that bothered, that all that Alan Milburn's done is taken over a role that was previously taken by a, a junior minister. That's a little disingenuous, I think. Though. Well, on this programme last night, John Redwood was making very light of the Tory reshuffle, saying that it had gone incredibly smoothly in contrast to Labour's reshuffle. Is that the case? I think he perhaps spoke too soon. Tonight it's emerged that Julie Kirkbride, who was culture, media and sports uh, spokesperson for the Tories, uh, first accepted a, a more junior job in the Foreign Office team there. Since then, she's thought again about it, decided that she doesn't want to demotion. She's going to spend more time with her three-year-old son. And uh, it seems that um, Michael Howard's finding out that reshuffling is a difficult business, even if you're in opposition. But is that about modernisers versus uh, non-modernisers? I think it's about approach, really. I think it's about um, people... Uh, like Judy Kirk Bride feeling that they, they don't want to, to make too much hay, they don't want to attack the government all the time, and, and she feels that she hasn't been given perhaps as much of a chance to, to make a positive case. David, thank you very much indeed. America raised the stakes today over Darfur when Colin Powell told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we conclude that genocide has been committed in Darfur and that the government of Sudan and the Janjaweed bear responsibility. The language is precise and crucial. Under the terms of the 1948 UN Convention, signatories are required to prevent and punish genocide. But just two days ago, the Foreign Secretary Jack Straw appeared to follow a different tack, saying the issue of whether there was evidence of genocide was being kept under review. Well, today the Tories criticised the government for delay in taking firm action. The UN Security Council is debating the crisis right now. Here is Robin Denslow. Darfur, the eastern region of Sudan, has become yet another African horror story. There's an ongoing civil war, and well over a million people have been attacked and forced from their homes by government forces or their allies, the Janjaweed militias. Some have fled to Chad, leaving border towns like Tine completely deserted. But the vast majority remain in camps within Sudan, now officially guarded by the Sudanese police. Today, as the UN Security Council met to discuss a new resolution on Darfur, the US Secretary of State Colin Powell pushed the conflict right up the international agenda by announcing that genocide was being committed there. When we reviewed the evidence compiled by our team, 
and then put it beside other information available to the State Department and widely known throughout the international community, widely reported upon by the media and by others, we concluded, I concluded, that genocide has been committed in Darfur and that the government of Sudan and the Janjaweed bear responsibility. And this in contrast to the more cautious approach by Jack Straw, who recently visited Darfur and was asked about the attacks. Does the British government consider that what has happened in Darfur amounts to genocide? Mr. Allen went on to me that we all agree that the parties in Sudan uh, uh, need to act to ensure that these violations do not continue. Um, the Secretary General is keeping the question of whether it is genocide under very close review. Uh, so are we. There's no question that tens of thousands have died in Darfur, that hundreds of thousands have been forced from their homes, and the violence is still going on. I got back from Darfur earlier this week and found that both in the north, around El Fasha, and in the south, around Niala, security has actually got worse, even within the past few days. But is this genocide? If that's defined as the systematic and planned killing of an entire national, racial, political or ethnic group, then it certainly covers those horrific mass killings we saw in Rwanda ten years ago. The attacks in Darfur may be atrocities, but not on that level. Which is why Colin Powell's use of the word genocide has caused some debate among those who recently visited Darfur. Well, I don't think that uh, the declaration of genocide can be just given like that. I strongly believe that it has to be the result of illegal inquiries. Uh, but uh, definitely the, the humanitarian situation is uh, really dramatic. When you see it, more than 200,000 refugees in Chad and 1 million and uh, 200,000 displaced in Darfur and uh, thousands of killed people and impunity going on and attacks continuing, I mean, that's, uh, I mean the, the reaction of the international community should be tough enough, uh, independently of a declaration or not of genocide. This uh, genocide, as Powell describes it now in Sudan, has been carried out over a year. Um, you're talking about perhaps 50,000 people killed already at least, according to the UN figures, and, and a kill rate of perhaps 1,000 a day from malnutrition, disease and from, from war wounds. Um, but it, it is expanding the definition of, of, of genocide in, in a way that uh, I think is intended to force the UN Security Council to take much tougher action with the government of Sudan. Colin Powell's timing was significant. He spoke of genocide just as the UN Security Council were meeting to discuss a draft resolution put forward by the US urging tougher action to try to force Sudan to end the violence. The draft resolution calls for a larger and more proactive monitoring force by the African Union. And it threatens Sudan with sanctions, including oil sanctions, if it doesn't act. So what effect will Colin Powell's intervention have? I think there are actually two sets of signals that are being sent. Uh, by Colin Powell's statement. One is to fellow members of the Security Council saying that this is an important issue for the United States. Uh, please take note. Uh, the second signal is that to Khartoum, the government in Khartoum, saying uh, we are watching, we do not uh, expect anything but the full uh, harnessing of the Zhuangzi, get the, getting the Arab militia back in their box. Uh, and perhaps if you don't, sanctions, including oil sanctions, uh, are on the horizon. What matters to this family fleeing from their burned village near El Fasha is not a semantic debate about the definition of genocide, but action to end the attacks. The US has shown it's determined to see change in Darfur. Now there will be pressure on other Security Council members. China has considerable oil interests in Sudan and Britain may now feel under pressure to take a tougher line. Robin Denzel, well earlier this evening I spoke to the Foreign Office Minister with responsibility for Africa, Chris Mullen. I started by asking him whether the British government agreed with Colin Powell that the violence in Darfur amounted to genocide. Genocide may well have been committed and that's why we'll be supporting uh, Colin Powell's call for the UN to launch an urgent investigation uh, into that question. Uh, whatever you call it, there's no doubt that very grave crimes against humanity have been committed in Darfur. But there's two different things here. Uh, first of all, uh, Jack Straw uh, said yesterday uh, the question of whether it was genocide was being kept under careful review 
The United States has made its own investigation. They've had people, they've spoken to 1,100 refugees. Is it genocide or not? Well, if you look at what Colin Powell said, he called for the United Nations to, to investigate and to come to a conclusion on he that point. He, he, he called said, it genocide. He called it genocide. He also said that, in his opinion, it was. Now, if it is genocide, uh, uh, are you prepared to agree with the Americans it is genocide? Well, we're certainly going along with the Americans in the call for a, a, a UN investigation. But the point is that there have been numerous investigations. Jan Pronk has been in the country. Uh, the Americans have made investigations. There are monitors in. If there has been systematic ethnic cleansing, that is genocide. And it carries a very weighty responsibility for action. Well, we have been probably the most, perhaps after the United States, the most active country uh, on this issue. Uh, and we remain in the forefront and we will be taking uh, as hard a line as possible uh, at, at the UN. Well, let's be quite clear here. What is the position? Because both Conservatives and Liberal Democrats are speaking with one voice, saying that the government is actually hiding from the issue and your position is unsustainable at the moment. Well, it's broadly the same uh, as the Americans. We are doing what Colin Powell has asked for, and that is we will support his call for a, a, a UN investigation into the genocide question to be included in the resolution but the, the, so the, there's not a lot of difference between us I, from the, the word genocide well, just, the word just genocide second, the, uh, from, from, i won't take any lessons uh, from the conservatives if you recall who were in power during the genocide in rwanda and that most certainly was genocide and also during uh, uh, the uh, the war in bosnia when they sat on their hands in both cases genocide as a word matters it's not semantics it carries with it a very strong connotation and it is used not lightly by the US uh, Secretary Colin Powell and it carries with it an imperative to act, either to act through economic sanctions or to act perhaps through military action. Which will it be? Well, it's too early to say yet, but uh, we, rest assured we will be acting and we have been in the forefront from the outset. We uh, already... Nothing that the Sudanese government really cares about. Well, there is a it, it, the Sudanese government is a very difficult government to put pressure on. And the other thing is we have to take our colleagues in the international community uh, with us. It isn't just a question of proclaiming and then demanding that everybody else falls into line. We actually have to take them with us. If action is not taken after Colin Powell has said quite definitely genocide has taken place, then the Sudanese government is going to consider that it's not an S-League off scot free, but that nothing is going to happen oh, to the, it. The Sudanese government is in no doubt what the international community feels about what has happened uh, in Darfur, and they are under constant pressure, and we have been leading uh, in applying this pressure, and we will continue to do so. So what do you reckon will happen after this Security Council meeting tonight? Will there be a definite plan of action? I, I can't predict the outcome in New York this evening. We'll have to wait and see. What would you like to see? We want to see the toughest resolution possible. And that tough and we resolution want to we want will be either sanctions or military action? Well, we want to see the toughest possible. And it will be a question, however, as, as I said, of taking our colleagues in the international community with us. And there, there is not unanimity on this point. But we have been and we will remain in the lead alongside the United States. Chris Mullen speaking earlier. Tomorrow morning's front pages now. We begin with the Independent. Their genocide, that word, starkly put across the banner of the Independent. Moving on to the Telegraph on the left-hand side. Milburn flexes his muscles as number 10 favourite. The Telegraph stirring it there. Uh, moving on to the story of uh, those terrible deaths um, uh, at the River Kwai of uh, Vanessa Ascott and Adam Lloyd. Backpacker shot dead in Thailand. Brown attacks weak EU growth as a Financial Times story and murder at River Kwai there. Now, we're moving on now to the story in the front page of The Guardian. And we brought David Grossman, our political correspondent, back. It signs new blow to Blair over Iraq. Yeah, this is the Iraqi survey group, the long-awaited report on whether there were Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. The Guardian says that they will report in two weeks' time, just in time for the Labour Party conference, and conclude that there were no weapons. Now, the government has been preparing the ground on this for a while. The Prime Minister admitted before the summer that weapons may not be found, but the timing just before the Labour Party conference will be embarrassing when the government wants to, to keep the uh, issues on the domestic agenda. Well, uh, the Labour critics want a show of repentance from Mr Blair and a promise of no more preemptive wars. So there we have it from The Guardian.
That's all from Newsnight tonight, but there's round-the-clock news coverage on BBC News 24 and at bbc.co.uk. I'll be back with more tomorrow, and Mark Lawson will be here for Newsnight Review. Until then, from all of us in the programme, a very good night. the knowledge of probability to work the stock market. Our vitamin safe. When I say the Lord's Prayer, I taste sausages. Did acid rain kill the dinosaurs? Everything changed with him after MMR. For a straight answer, look to Horizon. The new series starts the 16th of September on BBC Two. Fear produces adrenaline, which produces acting. Seven out of ten West End productions lose money. You've got to come home with some silverware or you're out of a job. A bad review will just knock your confidence. Two break even. Audiences are looking for the event. We need to create an event. But only one in ten makes a profit. The unseen drama of the West End. Theatre Biz, a new series coming soon to BBC Four. To find out how you can get BBC4 on cable and satellite services and Freeview, call 08700 10 10 10. Brazen humour in a slick French comedy spiked with mirth and malice. A film premiere for BBC2 as Gérard Depardieu stars with Daniel Otoy, who's about to come out of the closet he was never really in.